Hey everybody, I'm Yvonne Williams with Back to Earth Creations and in this video I want to show y'all how I make these uh, fused glass pendants. Actually these two very specifically because we're going to be going in depth about what colors I'm using and like what proportions I'm putting them in as and taking you real time through step by step. So let's get started. So I have prepped up my ceramic mold with zip. ZYP boron nitride coating. It's like um, but uh, greasing and flouring your pan before you bake a cake. It's going to keep the glass from sticking to our mold. And I'm coming through with this is a 96 COE and you want to keep your COEs consistent throughout the piece and um, but the same concept applies for if you're using you know 90 COE or even 104 COE like if you're smashing up some of your uh lampwork glass like um stubbies like it, you've got like little bits left you can make frit out of it and use that as well just uh, keep in mind stay consistent with it you could even do this with smashed up uh wine bottles and different things um though there's no guarantee how the color might translate but it might be fun to experiment just however you do it just keep consistent with uh with your coes so I'm taking a scoop of this is lilac opal. The opal doesn't necessarily mean uh, opal like um, opalescent. Well, okay, <laughs> it does mean opalescent, but not like like how fire opal has like that fiery flash in it. It's a term that means opaque. So whenever this glass is fired, it will stay like where you can't see through it. Whereas their translucent glass is, um, you can see through it. That was something that uh, was misleading to me whenever I very first got into working with glasses. Because I was like, ooh, opal. Thinking that it would look like all cool and flashy. To get that cool and flashy effect, I'm actually using dichroic glass. Um, for it in the same COE. But you can kind of see this has that neat opalescence and fiery flash and things um and so just kind of learning and that was lilac opal and the medium uh refers to the size of frit i really like medium frit but um there's there's like powder that you can use there's fine frit medium coarse and mosaic sized and then you can also use like specifically shaped pieces of glass and i'm just sprinkling in a little bit of white here to get some nice contrast and then I'm going to come through with just a soft bristled brush and I'm going to kind of stir and swirl. This is how I like to get my gradients because by doing more purple uh, proportionately than the white, um, whenever I stir it, the white will blend in and the purple will start to show through. And so now you can kind of see how that gradiates up just a little bit. But I just, eh, I'm just gonna stir the whole thing. <laughs> and now since we've laid some of that white down, we can now come through with a medium pale purple and this is a translucent. I found, um, at least with the ocean side, it doesn't always say translucent. But if it's opal, it says opal, if that makes sense. Like, this might be a good example. Like this one, light green, it doesn't say translucent or opal, so it's a translucent. Um, whereas if it were opal, it would say light green opal. Though I don't know, because over here, this one says just white, and it doesn't say opal, so there's no telling. I don't even know anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah okay so we've put the white in and I'm gonna sprinkle in on top of this some medium pale purple for it and I'm doing this because it will um, it's like doing an underpainting color with that uh, lilac opal and then now that we've laid this translucent purple over that, uh, we'll get some variation in the colors. 
how that comes through and I think I'm actually going to do a side-by-side -side contrast um so we have some purple and white in this one with the pale purple on top of it so I'm going to do the lilac and white without the pale purple on top of it over here in this mold I'm always careful to close up my frit because uh in between colors because Oh, it was like the, my first or second day of working with Frit at all, and I was sprinkled some out of my you know little measuring scoop here, and then dumped it in the wrong container. So I, I try to avoid that as much as possible. That and it's nice to just avoid spills and stuff. Okay, so just sprinkling in some more white. doing a bit of a stir there we go I like that and now we can come in and use some of this acrylic frit and this is a pretty chunky dichro and it's also quite pricey so being quite pricey, I want to make sure that I don't waste any by like losing it on the floor or anything like that. So we've gone through and we do, and I also really love the random placement of the die crow. Uh, you can be a little bit more specific like and intentional in its placement, but I get some floating results sometimes. So sometimes just because I put something somewhere doesn't mean that that's where it's going to end up when it's all said and done. Okay, so now that I've done the die curl layer, I'm going to come through with, this is mosaic size clear fit. And I also have some big old hunky chunky nuggets um, from, I, bat, I smashed up some studio nuggets. And whenever you, the larger a piece of glass that you use, the more uh, clear your final piece will be. Now this has a little bit of like something in it that I need to grind off. So I am not going to put that in our piece today. So I'm just gonna come in and mount this up. You could be very specific about like how many grams total that you use for in your piece, but I kind of like to just not do that. <laughs> um, you get kind of a little bit of an eye for it Oh, that's a big one. And about how much you need to distribute. If you're using a f smaller frit, you need to kind of add, like volume wise, add more. Because it has all these little air spaces between it. And so whenever it melts down in the kiln, Uh, it's going to like ice cubes melting the puddle okay so it's very messy with this but I wanted to show you guys how because sometimes my hands will be like all super shaky and stuff so you don't have to be crazy super precise with this and that's kind of nice you can just kind of slap some stuff together and see how it comes out it's a collaboration between uh, my hands random fate and gravity <laughs> and I've found personally I get much more interesting effects from just throwing reason to the wind and just going with the flow of it than what I do if I try to control what's happening if that makes sense because I'm so limited by my own creativity or my own thought process whereas if I just slap it together and it's like oh well that came out really neat and then I get to spend the rest of my life trying to replicate it and that's always fun <laughs> So this is how that's looking. And here's a view from the side where you can kind of see how mounded up the glass is. So the kiln that I have is a Paragon CS16S. Um, 
and it uses a Sentry Express 5.0 for the programming. So if you have your your kiln will have instructions of how to do, um, you know, this the programming and everything. But the firing schedule that I'm using is segment one with a rate of 400 degrees per hour until we get to a temperature of 1225 and this is all Fahrenheit and then we're going to hold that for two hours then we program the segment two to 600 a rate of 600 and then the temperature of 15 uh, 1500 to so 1500 and we're gonna hold that for 10 minutes and that's where the full fuse happens and then I program for segment 3 at a rate of full I don't do crash cooling or anything like that where I open up the kiln it's uh -uh. <laughs> I just let it at, as fast as the kiln can go I let it drop down to a temperature of 900 degrees and I hold that for three hours for segment four, at a rate of 45 degrees per hour, we lower down to 800. And the whole idea here is we want to cool all of the glass at the same rate. So I'm doing big pieces and little pieces and everything. So I want to keep them all on, uh, I'm going to be cooling at the rate of the slowest piece, which will probably be our bigger pieces because it takes longer for the center of that to heat up to the same temperature as the outside. Um, and then segment five at a rate of 81. And honestly, I just Googled uh, like bullseye glass because I had started with 90 COE and then I changed it from the uh, 90 COE. Ooh, actually I told you wrong. 90 COE fires at 900 and I got this from the bullseye website and uh, 96 COE fought and yields at 950. So I'm sorry, I was looking at the wrong, and I keep records of every time I do something new or try something new, um, I document it. But it gets to the point that it's like, you know, we're running the kiln basically almost every day. And so, and it's with the same exact molds and glass type and layout. And so I don't document for those ones. But every time I do something different, I document very carefully. That way I can try to replicate it. Um... And then at a rate of 270 degrees per hour, we lower it down to room temperature. I usually open my kiln up to the room whenever it gets below 200 degrees, just because that buys us an extra hour um, of time. And it usually takes me about 20 to 22 hours to run the kiln. And I'm still pretty new to this, so this works for me so I haven't been tampering with it too much but as we experiment more uh, I'm gonna start getting weird with it and I'll share that process with you guys too <laughs> last thought before I put this into the kiln I want to make sure whenever I'm using these holy molds like this um, which are the ones that have like a protrusion in the center that make like a bead with a hole in it or a focal with a hole in it I want to make sure that I'm putting enough glass up here at, with this narrow point because I've had a tendency in the past of if I don't put enough material there um, the surface tension of the fused glass will pull it away and I'll get a little too thin of a spot so it's just something to be mindful of so we're opening the kiln up the following morning it had gotten down to 80 degrees inside the kiln and this is how everything's looking so this is how the pendants look. I've just picked the mold up out of the kiln, so I haven't done anything to them yet. Looks like we had some kiln wash get picked up. Or not kiln wash, but um, mold release. So you can see I just kind of tap them right out. And some stuck to the back, but I'm going to take this and clean it up. I just brush it with um, a stiff bristle brush, like nylon bristle, and like uh, hot soapy water to get all the kiln wash off. And then I'll meet you guys back here to get a final look at them. Okay, so we've gotten them nice and tidied up. Um, first off, with this one, how the kiln wash like the mold release stuck to it. We do have some spots that the way that I would fix this is I would go through with, I have a diamond bit grinder that is self-lubricating 
and I'll be and this is going to be for a different video but I'll just grind that down to make sure it's all nice and clean and then I would set this with fresh mold release just as it is once it's been ground off um, back into the mold and then run it through the fuse cycle again I could just fire polish it but since I'm grinding out some space there I want it to level back off so that's what how we would how, how I would fix that. If you have a way of fixing glass um, that you'd recommend, I'd really like to hear that because there's probably an easier way of going about it other than what I am doing. So this is the difference though in how they came out with, this is the piece where we did a mix of the lilac and white um, on the bottom. and then capped it with the purple translucent and this is it where it's just capped and clear so you can see it gives us we still get some of the same lilac tones through but um with the translucent purple over the white it gives us a, like almost four different tones of purple as opposed to just the two Or three or four I don't know and then of course the beautiful dichro flashes I absolutely love that and keep an eye out for upcoming we have tutorials on how to wrap uh, wire wrap this style of stone um, as well as how to make it into a necklace that has a counterweight because these are quite large heavy glass pieces and sometimes you want to wear a huge necklace like this but you want to um, you don't want it pulling down on your neck so what i do is i actually counterweight with some other beads and stuff in the back of the design um, and i'll show you how to do that in one of our upcoming tutorials as well Oops. hey y'all thanks so much for hanging out with me during this video if you have any questions comments or ideas please leave them down below um if you enjoy our free tutorials and would like to support the creation of more of them, please consider checking us out over on Patreon. For as little as a dollar a month, we do all sorts of uh, exclusive live streams, behind the scenes content, um, oh, and just that's just the tip of it, like so much more. We do like the cap, cab boxes and craft kits and stuff. We also sell our handmade fused glass and polymer clay and laser cut stuff and all sorts of different things over on our website backtoearthcreations.com where um you can purchase our pre-made like we we make the glass then you can buy it and wire wrap it or set it in chain mail or polymer clay or whatever makes you happy and it's a great way of being able to collaborate and use some of our artwork in your artwork so um and if you do that, please, please, please send us a picture of it so that we can feature you and um, just see what you made because that's really cool. <laughs> um, thank you guys so much for watching. I really do hope that, 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 that this was helpful to you. And until next time, y'all, happy crafting. Bye. <laughs>